Hello lovely viewers, welcome to another exciting edition of Let's Talk Ghana here on Studio 2 Television. This program airs every Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays here on Studio 2 Television on YouTube as well as on Facebook. Coming up on today's edition of the show, the opposition National Democratic Congress, as the largest opposition country in the uh, largest opposition party in the country, is ready in itself come Saturday for its primaries. The party is going to the polls to elect parliamentary candidates for nearly 275 constituencies. I say nearly because some of the constituencies are on hold, and then to elect a flag bearer for the party who becomes the face of the NDC going into election 2024. We'll get expert opinion for you as to the chances of the three leading candidates. And much later, a farmer has dragged the Speaker of Parliament and the Attorney General Godfrey Dame to the High Court, praying the courts to, amongst other things, stop Parliament from continuing with processes to pass an anti-LGBT law. What's the basis of the argument that the legislature has failed to have a fiscal impact analysis on the yet to be passed bill? We'll get some details as to the suit and reactions for you here on Let's Talk Ghana on Studios 2 Television. I am Eric Mawena Egbeta. We're back to delve into the matters. Stay with us. You're welcome back to Let's Talk Ghana here on Studios 2 Television. I am your host, Eric Mawena Egbeta. We love to hear from you as this is a show that is interactive. And so leave a message for us on Facebook, the comment section, and as well as on YouTube, the comment section, and trust that we'll do the reading for you. Let's get into the matters now. And we're in 2023, 2024, pretty much to many people is around the corner. That is an election year. And going into an election year, political parties go to the polls to elect candidates who represent them at the constituency level and at the presidential level. So the party, the NDC, is this Saturday going to the polls to elect their flag bearer and parliamentary candidates for almost all the 275 constituencies, but for areas where the party has put on hold. The NDC as a party in itself will be addressing the media uh, in the coming days, but let's get into the conversation, particularly on the presidential ticket. John Mahama, Dr. Kwabna Dufo, and Kojo Bonsu. They are the leading individuals uh, ahead of the primaries. And the details will come up on Facebook for these individuals, what they've done. We're going to go onto the telephone lines and speak to a political scientist, uh, Jonathan Asantiotri. He will give us some expert opinion as to the lead up to this contest. But it's not just presidential. In the parliamentary race as well, it will be keenly contested in areas like Asawasi, Adenta, uh, Cape Coast North, and the likes. And so let's get on the phone now. Jonathan Asantiotri, he is a political science analyst with the University of Cape Coast. So joining us on phone is Jonathan Asantiotri. He's a political analyst with the University of Cape Coast. Joined us on phone for a conversation uh, this morning. Mr. Autry, many thanks uh, for speaking to us. And so, a big day for the NDC come Saturday. Your general thoughts on, particularly, the three faces challenging to lead the NDC to become the next flag bearer? Well, let me say good evening to our listeners. Um, I think that I'm not the one to reinvent the wheel. Mm. Um, it appears that apart from the media relations and then on the ground relations in terms of campaigning and how each of the presidential candidates has resonated with the grassroots as it were, there are messages out there and it appears that most of them are not, even the media as it were carry the message of one particular you know, um, a candidate and then of course, 
there have been some kind of balancing. Mm. But uh, apart from Dr. Dufour and uh, Mr. Kodebonsu, uh, it appears that Mr. Mahama's messages or message, you know, has gone down to the electorate or the delegate as it were. And it is mostly captured in the media more than the other, you know, competitors. And so generally, by and large, if you look at the surveys that have come out, mm. that have been done by, for example, Afrobarometer, we can talk of the CDD, uh, we can talk of uh, Global Info Analytics. I mean, the analysis that they have been doing and the surveys that they have been conducting, you know, it is about pitching Mr. Mahama, as it were, with either Dr. Baumia or Mr. Alan. And this is how the surveys have been. Now, when they brought in the other candidates, they did not really fare well. And so it is just obvious. It is just a matter of time that we will know that Mr. Mahama is likely to lead the NDC come 2024 elections. We've, you've, you've uh, in this analysis, almost suggested that because the message of Mr. Mahama has resonated quite well with the delegate. He stands tall as a clear favorite. Dr. Kwamna Bufo has been uh, quite visible in the media in the last uh, few weeks, touting his achievement. Can you hear me, please? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, I'm saying that Dr. Dufo has been uh, visible in the media in the last few weeks, touting his achievement as finance minister as well. You, you don't think that begins to play on the minds of the delegates ahead of Saturday? Oh, well, certainly. But of course, delegates will be much more worried or concerned about who is likely to unseat their main opponent, that is the MPP. And so, in as much as Dr. Dufour is a likable candidate, Mr. Mahama stands tall you know, when it comes to the truth. And so it is just quite unfortunate. Politics is also about timing. You need to do your timing, you know, very well to be able to say that, okay, if I go at this point in time, I'm likely to lose. Therefore, let me do my timing. Let me support whoever is there. You see, the point is that should Mr. Mahama contest 2024 elections and loses to the MPP, he cannot contest again. That will mean that the next NDC candidate, either Mr. Kojo Bonsu, you see, which is more likely, than Dr. Dufour because Dr. Dufour doesn't have age on his side. Mm. Even before the 2024 elections or post 2024 elections. You see, Ghanaians are, are witnesses of what Mr. Kufado you know, has done for all of us to see. You know, per his age and other things in terms of activeness and he's a bit docile. You know, he doesn't seem to be bothered about what is going on. He doesn't seem to be concerned about the tense, those is handless, you know, are doing in its name. So all these things have angered the Ghanaian Jews to the point that they really wouldn't want to do this kind of a try me, try me, you know, let me see what I can do. So you see that they want an experienced hand. Now, in the name of Dr. Dufour, you have an experienced hand. In the name of Mr. Mahama, you have an experienced hand. Mr. Kodibonso has also been there you know, throughout the period. But of course, by and large, if you have a candidate who in 2020 elections was able to, you know, uh, uh, garner that number of votes, over 6 point something million in 2020, it tells you that Ghanaians indeed really wanted a change. Mm. You see, they really wanted a change. And that, I think, was probably the NBC electoral machinery, they did not get in their act correctly. Now, I've also sat down and I've listened to Mr. Uh, Watinjan, for example, suggesting that, well, it is better to have someone who can go for eight years than four years. I'll tell you what, I think that that, for me, is an illogical argument. Now, the point is that you can only go for eight years when you have power. You must win power in order to think of the next election. Right. So if you don't have power, how do you think of the next election? Mm. So that, for me, there is that, you know, internal illogicality in that particular argument. 
So that is that. And I think that everybody believes, and, and no MPP person will be considering the 34, or they will be doing their permutation with Mr. Kudibonsu, you know, against either the Tabao or you, you believe it is that, that clear and quite cut out? Yeah, every now and then, it is when one Mr. Mama speaks, that is when, you know, they begin to jitter. And that jitter is, is, is always expressed in their responses. And Mr. Muhammad's messages carry a lot of weight than his compeers. So it is just too obvious. It is just too obvious. And of course, interestingly, they are going to do that with the parliamentary you know, primaries as well. Right. We'll, we'll get into the, uh, into the parliamentary primaries pretty shortly. Just a last one on the presidential primaries mm -hmm. as to how the ruling executives of the party can create a fair ground such that because of this overwhelming support that you talk about for Mr. Mahama, uh, other parties might not feel aggrieved that um, the party machinery is pushing one person through. Yeah. yeah. You see, I've always expressed my dissatisfaction when you have people in positions of authority and positions of trust, you know, openly uh, showing support for this or that. These things do not augur well for democracy. But I've also come to the realization that, well, I've also come to the realization that um, per their constitution, an individual can go heartily and willingly say that I support this, I declare my support for that. Mm. But you cannot use your executive position to coerce others and say that the whole of this organ of the party, we are in support of this. Now, that will have meant that those people are on a particular podium and they have asked you to speak for them. If that is the case, fine. Other than that, you cannot in any way coerce others and say that we are in support of this. That will amount to an unconstitutionality of which the party According to the secretary, you know, they are going to issue some kind of sanction. And I think that that in itself creates that level of fair playing ground, mm -hmm. you know, for all who are contesting. It is just that um, one particular candidate is overwhelmingly popular and overwhelmingly the favorite, you know, to win. That then becomes a bit difficult. That is why I said that politics is about timing. I see that Mr. Kodebosu can be the future of the NDC in terms of the presidential candidature, you know, in the future, as I said earlier on. Because, mm -hmm. look, you come from the Ashanti stock. The NDC is yet to have someone to come from the Ashanti stock. But for me, my analysis, um, throughout the period, I've realized that the NDC is the type of party that holds a certain clout that can even allow a minority tribe to lead. That means that it is about competency and what you are going to bring on board. And it could create that kind of, some, some kind of, there, there is that kind of euphoria surrounding the fact that, look, Dr. Dufour is an Ashanti. Uh, Mr. Kodibonsu is also an Ashanti. And so, if tomorrow you have an Ashanti leaving the NDC, as I said earlier on, it still reinforces the view that the NDC appears to be more nationalistic. Right. Less, less tribalistic than the MPP, you understand? Because other than that, you cannot have a Gunja who is from a minority tribe leading a party that won the elections in this country. So the NDC always lives by this kind of Congress. So once they congregate around you, which is typical of the name Congress, then it means that it is you that they are sending. And nothing else, you know, will change their mindset. Right, let, let's just delve now into the uh, parliamentary primaries. Yeah. Um, quite a number of constituencies to look ahead to. Readily, Asawase comes to mind because of the, the contest there. Uh, you've been looking across the aisle. Which are the constituencies of keen interest ahead of Saturday? Well, um I've seen the media they picked Asamasi, of course, you know, Mr. Muntaka 
acknowledge him, but he is out with his, uh, some members of his branch. He's taking them to court. He got them arrested. Virtually, you know, if they are not careful, they may even be denied the opportunity to vote. And that young man, Ahmed, I, I, I think, I, I don't know if I've gotten the name right, is the one who virtually is raising that particular contest to a level to, to a level that, you know, everybody is talking about. So that is a hot spot. Then you can talk of Abra Asebu Kwaman Kese, mm. uh, you know, the good lady, the lady professor, uh, I've forgotten the name, and then Phyllis Kwachio Kosu, who comes from the presidential hopeful of the NDC as it were, as a special assistant. And so um, if you look at what happened before the 2020 election in the primaries, I think it was a very close contest. Right. And so, and that also reflected in the national elections, which he lost by 173 votes or so. Then you can talk of such a, a front place. Uh, where you have Dr. Dufour himself, his son, um, and then Dr. Dufour's brother, who is the MP there, where his son wants to unseat his uncle. And so it is allowing uh, a very liberal candidate, who is a political scientist, you know, at KN USD, is it Dr. Brenya or so, mm. an opportunity to sail through. And I think that the class that he has as a doctor or as a professor, also, I think these are the caliber of people that the NDC will have to look up to in the future because, you know, they, should the NDC win the 2024 elections, they will need people who are fair-minded, you know, level-headed, to be able to come up with legislation as to that will help galvanize the, the, the grassroots and then ensure that the crisis that we are facing, you know, are nipped in the past. And finally, well, in the, I can talk of Cape Coast North, as it were. Right. You know, um, we seem to have Dr. Kwame Mintenya, who the NDC as a party, by the 2020, by after the 2016 elections, was not that attractive. It took the person of Dr. Kwame Mintenya, who comes from the academia. And you know that the Cape Coast North, you have quite a number, you know, of the populace from the academic fold. You can talk of the SHS, you can talk of the investors. Uh, the Cape Coast uh, UCC and that of uh, CCTU. And so you will need somebody of that caliber to be able to to maintain that power, as it were, in the Cape Coast North. Not any other person who probably has the resources and whatever it is coming from, as it were, to delude the mind, you know, of the delegate. You know, on that score, I think that if that is what the delegates are going to do, then they are likely to win the 2024 parliamentary elections of Cape Coast North. So th those are the, the constituencies to, to look out for. Mr. Santiotri, I want to thank you for speaking to us. Well, maybe in the later you know, uh, interview Inter we can talk about the others. Right then. I appreciate that you could speak to us, Mr. Santiotri. You're welcome. Man. That's Jonathan Santiotri. He is a political uh, science analyst speaking to us is with the University of Cape Coast. We're taking a break here. When we return, the anti-LGBT law uh, that's currently before Parliament, the proper human, sexual, and Ghanaian family values bill, um, is under scrutiny of the High Court. We'll get into details when we return. <laughs> You're welcome back to Let's Talk Ghana here on Studios 2 Television, where we put Ghana first in all of our conversation. Before we went on that break, I was talking to you about uh, a private individual, a farmer, as a matter of fact, dragging the Attorney General, Godfrey Dami, and the Speaker of Parliament to court, uh, asking the court to hold processes ongoing in Parliament over the anti-LGBTQ plus bill because a fiscal impact analysis has not been done. I won't want to uh, talk much, but let's just put that uh, suit on your screens now and go through the details uh, as we have it. And so it's a private individual by name Paul Buama Sefa, and he's the one who's uh, dragged the, um, the Attorney General and then the Speaker of Parliament to court, the High Court to be precise, and is asking the court to make a number of uh, uh, rulings, to make some rulings, uh, six of them. 
The first one, that Parliament has a non-discretionary obligation to ensure that all statutory requirements relating to the presentation and or consideration of the promotion of proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian Family Values Bill, which is the anti-LGBT bill, placed before the House includes the requirement for the bill to be, includes the requirement for the bill uh, to be, to have, to be accompanied rather by a fiscal impact analysis uh, when it was first laid in the House. And then a declaration that the failure of Parliament to have this done that all processes from the start of the bill to this point be declared now and void. And then an order restraining Parliament and its deputies and all other individuals who work for Parliament from proceeding with any processes relating to the bill. And then an order for Parliament and all of its assigns and previews to ensure compliance with Section 101 of the Public Financial Management Act. Uh, 2016 Act 921. So that's the details of the bill as captured uh, on your screens now. And we're going to subject this to some analysis. Adam Senanu is an advocate. We're the advocate for Christ Ghana. He's going to join us on phone now, and then we pick thoughts from him. So Adam Senanu has joined us on the telephone line now. Let's speak to him. Mr. Senanu, uh, many thanks for speaking to us. And so um, tell us what jumped to you when you first heard about the suit and read details of the suit. Well, yeah, we, we are in a democracy and people are exercising democratic rights. Uh, in my view, 90% uh, of Ghanaians have a position on this matter. So eventually to go through, but somebody has a contrary view and wants to use legal processes, uh, we will not begrudge them that that right. I, I think it's okay. You, you think it's okay? A farmer, as a matter of fact, uh, making the case that because there's no fiscal impact analysis, he wants the entire process leading to this point where the bill is awaiting second reading on the floor of the house be declared null and void. Some would say uh, quite suspicious. Oh, of, I mean, I don't think the word is suspicious. It's an attempt to uh, undermine the progress made. And it, that's what it is. Um, we don't need to be um, shy of calling it what it is. But be that as it may, Parliament is a master of his procedures. And uh, as has been pointed out, there's so many other bills before and probably after that will go through the process without a fiscal analysis. Indeed, because we are worried that the issue of finances or a budget putting a, a cost to the state mm. would arise, right. uh, we ensure that the current version doesn't place any kind of uh, financial burden on the state. So, how, how so? Have, if you could just elucidate a bit for us. Oh, oh Paul, I mean, Parliament itself had gone through the. Mm. They've come up with a framework for bills that they will consider as bringing a burden on the state, and those that will not. Right. So, for example, if it's something that deals with uh, the police or prisons, which are things that the state already is paying for, that is not considered a fresh burden on the state, um, unless it is something, a totally new uh, cost center. So those arguments have been ironed out already in parliament, and they've settled them, and they have a framework, and they're applying the framework. So that's why, I, in my view, the conclusion of the matter will still be the same, because parliament is a master of its own procedures. Uh, and they have analyzed it and believe that this peer, private members bill is not going to do that. That's why it's passed this whole uh, process. And mind you, this has been a very long process with both sides, uh, you know, arguing it out. So um, we are quite certain that whatever happens before this parliament rises, this will go through. Uh, this may delay it a bit, but it's a democratic state and people have their rights. So you're optimistic that this will not in any way derail uh, uh, the, the attempts to have the bill passed? 
No, I doubt it. Uh, I, I mean, this is an arm of government and they know their procedures. Uh, and uh, I'm not quite sure that this, on what basis you're going to question the speaker when the processes have been followed. Um, <laughs> you'll be opening a kind of worms if, if they attempted to rule in a particular direction. Uh, there'll be so many things that government has already passed that will be called into question. Uh, I don't see that happening. Right. Um, you, as advocates for Christ and your other counterparts, uh, just a little away from Bastille on the LGBT and the surrounding conversation on the bill, you've thrown your weight behind seven of the proponents of this private member's motion. Why has it become necessary? Oh, we just think that it would be out of place for us given the, um, the effort and sacrifice these persons have made in Parliament to bring this that far. Uh, not to have shown that, I mean, we have confidence in what they stand for. Um, and that's where we are coming from. That there are certain issues uh, where, as far as we are concerned, in terms of the ethics of it and what they have stood for, um, they are the kind of people we believe they stand for the values that we think are important mm -hmm. to move in this nation forward. So it is in keeping with what they stand for, which aligns with what we stand for, that we are throwing our weight um, behind them, absolutely. Right then, Mr. Senanu, I appreciate that you could speak to us. And thank you for having me. That's Adam Senanu. He is one of the lead proponents of Advocates for Christ Ghana, speaking to us this morning here on Let's Talk Ghana on Studios 2 Television. We're going to end the show uh, with the police because they are in the conversation again, this time round on suspicion that a senior police officer has killed a junior one. And that statement will just be rolling on your screens um, for you where the police says that they've commenced investigations into the circumstances surrounding the death of a police constable in the Western North region on the 5th of May. And it says that the constable met his untimely death when he was allegedly shot by one of his senior colleagues of the Western North Regional Police Command. And so the police says that the Inspector General of Police, uh, as at Saturday, had dispatched two separate teams to the area for investigations to proceed. And we'll be bringing you details as to exactly what transpires uh, as and when these investigations come to end. That is it for today's edition of Let's Talk Ghana here on Studios 2 Television. We're back again on Wednesday with another exciting edition. As always, we'd love to hear from you. And so always do leave a message in the comment section for us. I am Eric Mawena Egbeta. This is a show where we put Ghana first in all of our conversations. Do have a great day. Studios 2 TV. The truth is here in your eyes.